And I have to say, Speaker, the one number I haven't heard yet from anybody today is 11,880, which are the number of our fellow citizens that have perished. Our governor has been nothing but an honest, steady voice leader leading us through this health crisis. Uh, and if we're to the point that we're debating that nail salons should have been open two weeks sooner, I, I guess that's a positive thing. But let's not forget and let's keep our eye on the ball regarding keeping our New Jerseyans safe. It is time to, to talk about the, the, the dollars. Uh, and, and I've heard four or five of my colleagues talk about the billions and billions of dollars we're getting from the federal government. So let's talk about one thing and the only thing. And that came from the CARES Act. And New Jersey, based on our population, received $3.4 million. The state of Wyoming, based on their population, received about $2,100 a person compared to New Jersey that got $377 per person. And can you even compare the challenges that that thing had versus ours? We are here on this historic call, Speaker, because the federal government hasn't done right by this great state. And that's not disparaging our congressional delegation who's doing everything they can. It's disparaging the leadership on the Senate side and from our president. Now, ironically, that $3.4 billion that we are supposed to get isn't, isn't yet certain that it's even going to be a grant. Who knows? When Governor Murphy had to speak out about the injustice of President Trump tear gassing, peaceably protesting citizens, who knows whether Mnuchin calls tomorrow and says, ah, you can't use that money as we said we could. But hopefully, Speaker, for this fiscal year, between the unprecedented rainy day fund combined with the dollars that we were able to have in a uh, surplus, plus over a billion dollars in cuts and freezes, we don't need to borrow for fiscal 20. Now, I don't want to sound like uh, Game of Thrones, but winter is coming. And for this state, winter is October. We have an eight-month fiscal year about to start with a $5 billion deficit. Uh, Madam Chair spoke before about if we cut every job from the governors to the most recent person hired in human services, that would only be $5 billion. We still couldn't do that because it's only over eight months, so it's already it. $5 billion. Can we wait for a vote in November? Of course we couldn't. Could we wait to see what the federal government might do? How can they be trusted? We have to be ready. And we'll all agree with Assemblyman Weber that it's just that. This is a line of credit. And right now we have two choices. One of the private markets, which we know historically are going to cost us more. And secondly, the Federal Reserve Program. Now, why do we need to move now? Because 257 entities for this great nation, including bi-state rail uh, authorities, have access to it. It could be done. So we need the access now. And you know what? Truth be told is we know that the interest rate won't be greater than 3%, hopefully. Just like with the, the, the payroll protection laws, that continues to be a moving object. It's not clear as to how Treasury is going to lay that out. But at the end of the day, we need to open this line of credit because winter is coming. Now, anyone that would argue that we're giving the governor a blank check is forgetting as to who is on this call. We are the legislature. The governor cannot spend a penny. A cent of the dollars that this administration is authorized to draw upon if it is necessary when winter comes without our authority. And if we don't do all the things that my colleagues suggested with the philosophies that have been typical of the Democratic Party and caring for those who need us most, but nonetheless cut everywhere we can, then shame on us. I know that we will do that. But we can't do it with a gun in our face with a $5 billion deficit in eight months. It just doesn't work. Now, Mr. Speaker, I just want to raise a final point as it relates to our state constitution. And uh, I know you cut them off, and hopefully you won't do that to me because I, I enjoyed assembling the room. 
speaking a little bit about the esteemed history of, of this great state, you know, I, I came to this body 18 years ago. Uh, Al Peroni, which many of you will remember, the head of all last gave me a book about the, the Book of Proprietors, which uh, went deeply into the history of the state. And I found a little wisdom uh, in that book relative to trying to find something that was precedent for what it is that we're going to vote upon today. Uh, back in 1860 was the first piece I found. Uh, George McClellan, who would eventually be our governor, was leading the army of the Potomac and the state of New Jersey and its legislature was in a financial emergency. I'm going to quote from the legislature back in 1862. We an emergency to what requires a massive financial outlay across fiscal years. And that's why they went out and borrowed general obligation bonds. Now, this invariably gets argued before our Supreme Court. I don't know what precedent that might have, but I think there's some juxtaposition that could be done because it was used for matters that went beyond implements of war, but to, to fill budget needs. But let's fast forward 70 years to 1932 and the Great Depression, a time when our unemployment was at levels here in this great state similar to what we find them to be today, quite frankly. There was emergency borrowing through general obligations done in 1932. And, quote unquote, it was looked upon with great propriety by the citizens of our state. It was that quote by our framers in 1947 the founders of our state constitution, when they amended or added to the debt limitation clause, quote, to meet an emergency caused by an act of God or disaster, end of quotes. Now, I know all 80 of my colleagues take our obligation, a sacred obligation, to upheld the constitution. I, I, I don't know, and I'm not smart enough to understand what our Supreme Court might or might not do. But I can tell you this. That can't be more direct and profound, having its genesis in a financial crisis similar to this, to meet an emergency caused by an act of God for disaster. Now, let's mention Lance versus McGreevy, 2005. Totally distinguishable. That was an independent authority, the EDA, who was not bought on general obligation bonds, but rather contract bonds. And the court never at all talked about the documentation clause whatsoever. It referenced that being inappropriate based on the appropriation clause, separate and distinct. So although I'm sure that case will be cited, it's misguided as it relates to being applied to the situation before us. It is fully and completely distinguishable. We are going to, with the imprimatur of this House, and hopefully ultimately the Senate, with the governor moving forward, dealing with the debt limitation clause in the greatest of emergencies that there could be. And I have every confidence that our Supreme Court, the third branch of government, will indeed know what we did was with propriety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank you. I compliment you for your leadership. I, I, I digress to note that your personal philosophy that I've experienced both when you were a member along serving next to us and now as our Neither the speaker has been to be fiscally conservative. I know the budget chair has a very similar disposition. Um, but we've all had to be sober here. Sober in the wake of a disaster, of a making that of, of no one's fault, uh, but of one that we are left to act with wisdom uh, for those who don't know our names. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I'll proudly vote for this bill.